He's a 12-time All-Star, four-time All-NBA first team, seven-time All-NBA defensive first team, uh, one of the greatest basketball players ever, not just for his size, period. One of the great basketball players for this time, even though all we do is rings culture, and so he doesn't have enough titles like LeBron, and so we somehow disparage and diminish a man who has been great. Which is by the way, and I think Chris can agree with me on that. This thank whole you. rings thing and this whole why is he putting out a book now, it's absurd. Yes, thank you, Billy, for all your contributions here. I'd like to not hear from you again. 61 <laughs> is the name of the book, Life Lessons from Papa on and Off the Court. Uh, Chris, thank you for uh, joining us. I am really a big admirer because I don't feel like you've been I just don't feel like you've been fairly chronicled, that people don't understand how hard it is to be as great as you are, not just at your size, but also at your size, because Jokic is out there. And what the hell is that? Jokic is damn good, I tell you. But damn, Billy, you ain't got to take that, man. I'm just Jeez. saying. I'm here trying to defend you. Damn. Dan does nothing but talk ass <laughs> about you. And I'm like, that's my boy, right. Chris. No, listen, I, I appreciate it, man. Dan, uh, it's hard, man. I, I didn't play for a long time, as you know, and play with a lot of really, really good players, a lot of great coaches. And uh, one thing that Doc Rivers used to say all the time is that you need luck, too. <laughs> you know, and unfortunately, I'd have had a lot of bad, bad luck. Oh, you would have had pretty good luck if Stern simply hadn't vetoed your trade to the Lakers. You would have had all of those championships. <laughs> Who knows, man? That was a crazy time. It, who, you know, it's crazy uh, to to think about what could have been. You know, what I mean, me and Kobe got on the phone. We had talked, but you know, everything happens for a reason. What do you regard? Because I want to get into why you wrote this book, what it is that you wanted to do to honor your father, why you chose Mike Wilbon, and I want to get into just how it is you've mastered the power game with players union and having a relationship with the big hitters like Iger. I want to talk about the breadth of your work away from the court, but what do you regard as like the basketball thing that has wounded you the most, that has just hurt, whether it's a loss or a vetoed trade or just something that, uh, you know, represents like this business is cold, man. No, nah, it, ain't, it ain't about the business being cold. It's just hard. You know what I mean? And when you're in sports and whatever you're in, you, you want to win. You know, I don't care who you are. You're trying to win. You hate to lose. And I think for me, um, it's, it's been tough. Uh, you know, the losses, some of the injuries, the time and all that stuff. But you got to get back to it. I, to, I sort of talk about that in the book or whatnot. But I I think, I mean, you've been in this a long time, uh, longer than I, I, I've been playing. So I think the other part that comes to is the gratitude of being able to still play. You know, you saw uh, Lou Will retired recently a couple of days ago. And Lou Will is one of the best players ever play in our league. And we were the last two people from our draft class. So it's crazy to think, you know, people going to always say this and say that. But I'm, I'm grateful that I still get to hoop. So you won't give the ammunition of I'm not going to tell you what my greatest heartbreak is. I don't want to talk about heartbreak. I want to talk about I'm grateful. Well, I don't think it's, it's one thing. You know what I'm saying? I don't care who you are and what you do. Like. I could run off a list of, damn, I hate that this happened, or I hate that this happened. You know what I'm saying? But if you live like that, then how to, I mean, excuse me, talking like I'm talking to my homie. You know what I'm saying? Like, but, like, how do you move forward? You know what I'm saying? Like, how do you move forward if you always don't dwell on something like that? It's interesting you say that, right? Because that's the price and the cost of being as great as you are and getting as close to team maximum sports accomplishment you you can't be better than you are right chris like you're maximizing you have maximized from your career you have been every bit as great as you can be you couldn't be a step greater well shoot i don't think you didn't ever talk to any athlete and don't think that they believe that they can you know and i think that's the thing about why you don't quit why you don't get why you keep going you know what i'm saying you you always trying to be better than you were. And so I I know for me that's the case. I don't never go in the gym and be like, damn, I'm good enough. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I and I gotta believe those who have won championships or won or whatnot, that they don't come back the next year saying, like, okay, I'm cool, you know? Hey Chris, it's Mike. I don't think many people in our audience or who follow the NBA regularly know how difficult it is for you to just get your body ready to play. You've had 
well chronicled knee injuries. There's uh, people out there that say you have very little car- cartilage left. Like, what kind of pain do you go through day to day just to play at the level that you've played at? Uh, you've done much of your, your your main achievements on the court post this Damn, they say, huge they say knee I injury. No, they say I ain't got no cartilage left. Yeah, that's Damn, what they I say. I didn't say. I had one knee injury. <laughs> yeah, but but a lot of wear and tear on that knee, and I just it's really to give you your flowers because you've overcome a knee injury that you don't make excuses for, and that many people aren't even all that aware of of how painful. It's all about pain management, isn't it? Uh, no, nah, I mean. I mean, a lot of stuff sometimes can be excuses. You know, you've seen guys now in this league come back from all types of injuries. So, uh, my, shoot, I had meniscus surgery back in, like, 2010, something like that. So, I mean, I done had hand surgeries. I done had four hand surgeries since I've been in the league. But you you, you get back. People done had a lot worse than that. That's a funny athlete mentality right there. No excuses, even though there might be some explanations. But the book is about hard work, okay? And forgive me, I said it was uh, lessons from your father. It's lessons from your grandfather and how it is to work hard and what it means to work hard. So you frame it that way, Chris. You don't give anyone the ammunition of I'm not making excuses for pain or hand or knees. Everybody plays through it. But explain to me the roots of your hard work because you've written this book, at least in part, because that's your imprinting. Yeah, my my grandfather got murdered when I was in high school, right? When I was 17, and uh, he got murdered by five teenagers. Uh, The day before, November 14, 2002, I signed my letter of intent to go to Wake Forest. And my grandmother died when I was seven from lung cancer. So uh, my grandfather was my best friend. He was my ace. We was together all the time. And so he got murdered the very next day on the 15th. And then on the 19th was uh, his funeral. And so the very next day after his funeral was the first game of my senior year. And I scored 61 points uh, for every year that my grandfather had lived. And uh, not knowing at the time that I would be blessed enough to go on and play this long NBA career. Like at that point, that was the highlight of my life. And why did you choose to write about this imprinting and Michael Wilbon chosen as the writer to tell this story because you could have waited till the end of your career you could have done this at any point in your career why are you doing it now you know it's funny because uh i chose will bond because i've known him for a long time i actually knew will bond uh before i even played an nba game and so just knew how well respected he was and then on the other side i chose now because uh you know when i was in high school right after it happened someone came down and asked if we wanted to do a movie and i was like with my parents, didn't know if it would mess up college eligibility. And I'm glad we waited till now because now I got kids of my own. I got a 14 year old son and a 10 year old daughter. And so I was able to give different perspectives now than I wouldn't have been able to give as a 25 year old kid or whatnot. So it's it's been dope to learn. And I, and I open up and talk about a lot of things that hard times, you know what I'm saying, from college, different incidences that happened or whatever. And I explain them a little bit more in detail. What do you regard as the most interesting parts of the book or your journey or what it is you're trying to share with an audience that you don't have to share it with them? Yeah, uh, I think in the book, I sort of talk about why I'm wired the way I am, you know, and why I compete the way that I do. And I, I sort of explain like my foundation and my family, you know, that's one thing. Some guys are a lot more open about things. Some guys are a little bit more closed off. I, obviously, I know I'm in the public I with a lot of things that happen, but um, I think I explain a lot about why I compete the way that I do and who who I do it for and what keeps me sane, to tell you the truth. Well, what does? My family. <laughs> my family. I'm, I'm blessed and fortunate. I got, I got my wife. I got my two kids. I got uncles, aunts, cousins, my parents. I mean, my parents live in North Carolina, live in Winston-Salem. I just finished my 18th season. My parents still make more than half of my games every year. You know, and so I'm sure that's probably not everybody's normal. (laughs) Well, I wonder how that one goes over, right? Because I've read all your comments and you are, I mean, always a professional in public. Uh, You don't do the things that end up in headlines that make you or anyone look bad. But you come home whenever it is you get the news of 
Well, I took Phoenix to the finals a couple years ago, and every team I go to wins a lot more when I get there. And my gratitude for that is they're shipping me off. They don't want me anymore. And you've said all the right things publicly about, well, business is cold, but I understand this is a business. But how does this one go over with your family? Yeah, they ain't with it, you know, but they also they also know the business too. You know, my my family, anybody who knows me, they know my family. They know my parents. My parents here in New York on this book tour with me, you know, my parents actually talk to all the incoming rookies' parents every year for the last 18 years about what to expect from a parent's perspective. But uh, you know, I'm I'm so blessed to seriously have people that also see the big picture, you know, and so you know, sometimes people try to take your kindness for weakness. You figure it out and uh, you just keep pushing. What does they ain't with it mean? What they ain't with it? Listen, if I'm, you don't have family and people that ride for you day in and day out, then, you know what I'm saying? Billy, talk to them. Tell them what it means. I was going to say, I mean, what kind of question is no, that? No, I know. I want specifics, though, of who's coming to him. I know what it means, but I'm who's coming to him know. and saying, I can't believe. Dan knows Phoenix. what it means, but if the audience doesn't I know I can't what it believe means, Phoenix You sure that? about that? No, you know what? It, it ain't It ain't that. I'm going to tell you that. You, you make trades and all this stuff like that. It's a business, man. I done literally seen everything that you could see uh, on in, in this league, right, from trades. And I... It, it, it's not like being traded or whatnot. I think the thing that always messes up any situation is the communication aspect. So, is there any point you learned it, Chris? Where because you sure you didn't come into the league knowing okay it's a business. You expected the employer to to value you, or you came in knowing that. Well, then, nah. I mean, you think about it. I got drafted when I was 19, 20 years old, right? I didn't know what to expect, which is why I ended up getting involved in the union and why I stayed involved in the union so so long is, I mean, I'm a consumer too. I'm a, I'm a fan. So once upon a time, I used to be the kid that see stuff come across and be like, man, how did this guy blow $20 million? <laughs> you know? And then I came into this life and I got a chance to see what can happen and how people try to pull you here and pull you there. So you start to realize that uh, it's tough when you're a kid that gets drafted and this is the highlight of your life, but now people want you to be the best basketball player that you can possibly be, but they also want you to help this person, help that person, and that person. So it's just a, it's a, a unique perspective. So was there an age or a time that you learned it? Because if you come in not knowing and then you get on the treadmill and the treadmill is lopsided, you got to be great. And it consumes all of you got to be great. Got to get to the top. Everyone's trying to be the great, uh, the greatest. Where do you learn it? They're like, oh, that doesn't feel the way that I'd like to have a partnership with my employer in the age of player empowerment when I'm running the players union as well. And I'm trying to make deals with these owners. Yeah, I don't know if it's just that aspect of it. I was more so speaking of it from uh, like players. That's why vets are important, right? Like I had PJ Brown when I came into the league who sort of just taught me a little bit about finance here and there, right? Um, Vets are important, teammates are important, relationships are important, and our league is so different now than it was when I first came into the league. You know, the way guys are involved in other businesses off the court and just the conversations, the camaraderie. I think something that was so big with me, Melo, D-Wade, and Braun, right? I'm sure y'all the banana boat crew, whatever, right? What made that relationship so special, to tell you the truth, is because I got my brother, I got my homies that I grew up with that I talk to all the time, but there are some situations that they just will never understand. You know, I'm sure, Dan, you got some friends or whatnot that live sort of a similar lifestyle to you, but other people who don't, who when you explain things to them, it's just different, right? So those relationships are so important for you to have, especially when you're thrust into a limelight that you know, you don't really know anything about. The name of the book is 61 Life Lessons from Papa on and off the court. What would you regard as the greatest challenge you had as president of the NBA Players Union? The Ooh, greatest which one? one? Man, I don't think you got enough time on this show today for, for all of that stuff. <laughs> you know, um, I mean, we moved the union offices from, from Harlem to where they are now. Um, 
went through. I don't know. You almost got to ask me for me to remember. Well, you you just <laughs> should. We'll, we'll do it next time when we have more time. I didn't have moving being up there. Uh, yes. Well, he's just moving's going a pain he, in the ass. I mean, <laughs> that's very that's actually very relatable. He's yeah. going to the very beginning of this because he's he's explaining to you from the beginnings of these guys took over the business. Wait, you were boxing stuff, <laughs> Chris? They're not about it. Everything. Everything. <laughs> Chris, thank you. 61, life lessons from Papa on and off the court. We'll do it again in a longer form, sir. I really have admired your pioneering because you have uh, – that that whole crew ended up changing the league. You guys being good at business ended up changing – I don't know where it is on your list of prides, but ended up changing the amount of power that play, players have, not only in that league but in sports. You know what, Dan? It's crazy. I say this and I, I go is aside from the power, because I know what the conversations be like. They'd be like, should players be able to do this or should they be able to say this or whatnot? But probably the coolest thing from my time at the union is we're the only sports league that has uh, health insurance for retired players. Yeah. See, that's one of the things that he did. And I don't know if I put it at the top of his list because he's got plenty of things to be proud of. Uh, thank you again, Chris, for sharing the time with us. And thank you for writing the book and sharing the wisdoms in it. Appreciate y'all. Thank you. Great timing for a book.